Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to, I believe, episode four of uh, Building Games with Seth. So we're building a game live on stream. Uh, this game has no particular purpose or direction. I'm just kind of taking suggestions from people in the stream, uh, implementing scope-limited features that people would like to see, as well as kind of offering explanations on how things work. And we're going to be trying to build this game from scratch so that you can see everything that goes into it and the thought process behind how it's made. And uh, for those of you who are new to the stream, the source code is available on GitHub for free. So this is the whole purpose of this project is to just kind of give some uh, tools to the game dev community. So if you guys let me know if my uh, audio is okay, if there's any issues with sound. Otherwise, uh, we're just gonna keep going. Okay. So last time we made some axonometric tiles, which you can see here. This is that kind of diamond shaped tile. Uh, we converted the whole world to an axonometric grid. So this used to be a rectangular grid and now it's got this nice diamond shape. And that took some work on building a new coordinates management system. We added tile ripples, which you can see as I step on the tiles, they kind of kind of bounce down. So that's still kind of a rudimentary system, but it's, uh, it's doing the job for now. We also updated world generation to have bridges and directional bias. So you can see now our floating rooms are connected to each other. And I can walk around. And then the last thing we did is we added edge detection to player movement. So I can't walk off of ledges and I have a nice little slide so that if I press against a ledge then I'll still continue, like if I press down here, I don't get stuck and I just kind of slide nicely down. So we got some nice movement going on, we've got a nice sort of play space to start to actually do stuff. And so I think in this stream we've got a few options of what to work on. <clears throat> so uh, I think probably we want to maybe consider adding some stuff to the world. Uh, maybe some enemies. So first maybe we can throw some environmental objects in there. Um, some enemies and maybe some kind of player ability where we can actually start interacting with the enemies in some way. Um, I could also spend some time today on art and making some actual, some kind of representation for the character, the enemies, stuff like that. But uh, it's going to be the case that that's all still going to be kind of exploratory. Just trying to figure out what it is this game is, is about. Because we haven't really landed on that yet. Um, we could also potentially put some time into controller support and kind of showing how to do uh, multiple input streams at once. So like, how would you do on-screen controls plus keyboard plus, uh, plus a controller taking that all at once in a way that's not going to mess up your code and kind of turn it into a spaghetti mess. So that's an option of what we could do. Uh, and the last thing, which is kind of interesting, is, is the idea of a settings menu. And this sounds kind of boring, right? Because like, who cares about a settings menu? Um, but if you get a settings menu in your game super early and make a system where you can really easily turn settings on and off, then you'll end up with a scenario where you can super easily add all kinds of useful developer toggles in your game that any tester or anybody can use uh, to kind of debug things. So, so settings menu, we may not, we probably won't do this stream, but just know that that's probably something that we should do at some point in the near future. Um, so let's, let's kind of focus on first just adding some stuff to the world and doing some just general world spawning. So I think, I think what we want to do is, uh, is probably anywhere that we have a, a, like an edge space, we probably want to put some stuff there. Probably not if it's a bridge. Um, and then the interior we would reserve for, for enemies and, and stuff like that. Um, so let's just go ahead and make some, some placeholder assets and then we can fill that in a little bit later and we can do that in our inkscape file actually instead of in the in the pixel art 
Something else we're going to do today is fix up this Inkscape document. Uh, so our document, you notice how this is blinding white and we have this weird sort of page border thing. None of this is really helpful or, or useful for us. So we're going to turn off that page border, change the background color of the document to uh, just about half dark gray. And this is going to allow us to see things in a little bit more of a neutral light so that we things don't because if things are purely on white then they feel darker than they are if they're purely on black then they feel brighter than they are so this is kind of a nice way to uh to take care of that and let's get these bounding boxes okay so i'm going to make a, a placeholder object that's just going to be kind of like a a world doodad of, of some sort and a, a good method to use is is to keep a template available for a grid space so that you always kind of have a, a nice clean reference for um, for sort of what si what scale things would be so I've got my grid space here just gonna kind of lighten that up and I can kind of center that move this down so we can give ourselves some vertical space here to make some kind of a, an environmental object. So we could do a couple different ones, which is probably a good idea so that we get some variety. And these are for now just going to be kind of kind of placeholders. So so we're not going to stress too much about making them look particularly good. All right, so I'm going to switch to my pencil tool here. I've got a uh, smoothing set to 32, which is pretty useful. If I turn this down, if the smoothing is, is super low, then I draw something. If you look at the nodes, you'll notice that, that uh, let's see, let's draw another one. 32. So you notice how there's a lot more nodes uh, when the smoothing is turned down versus when I have it smoothing turned up, but the line is just as clean. So what this really means is if you're drawing with your pencil tool using a low amount of smoothing, then you're gonna end up with your Inkscape file kind of getting bogged down and, and slower. Uh, so we're gonna stick with something a little higher. Um, I think, I don't know, do you guys have any sense of where you would like to see this uh, I duly noted. Nice. Do you guys have any sense of what kind of a, a scenic environment you, you think this game should be? Because like we could be floating in space. We could be uh, like in a robot factory thing. Uh, we could be... I don't know. Seamus asks, how do you get the tools that you have? Inkscape's tools out of the box are very weird. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean. If you have any specific questions about that I could probably answer some moss covered tiles so yeah we could do some kind of sort of a forest environment or something and also the fact that you know in, in in game we are technically like floating in a void um, that's fine I mean if you look at a game like bastion you know you're they kind of explain it, and they're like, oh, there was a calamity, and now there's weird stuff happening. It's like, you can do whatever you want, and then you just have a sentence somewhere that kind of hand-wavy explains, like, oh, yeah, we're in a, the floating forest of bleh. Boom, you've got your, you've got your lore. So, uh, all right, so let's do some kind of, uh, maybe like a small plant of some kind. Mm-mm gonna pencil tool this thing now I'm not our studios artist here so this is gonna be pretty rough okay I just want to leave
And when you're working on shapes, sometimes it's better to just cut nodes out. Convert that node. Join these together. And we don't need to spend a huge amount of time on this because we're just going for sort of atmosphere. Later on, what we do uh, as a game developer is you get your friend who's good at art to remake this stuff. Okay, let's make this. Uh, what color is this leaf? I don't want to do green because that's, you know, silly. Purple. Kind of a... Yeah. The Inkscape UI isn't very intuitive. Yeah, I've tried to use um, Illustrator and it, uh, I, I find that, that I don't quite get that workflow. So I think everybody's just kind of got their thing. Maybe it's part of what you're used to. Kind of looks like a tongue here, which is kind of weird, but maybe that's what we want. Like a weird tongue plant. Yeah, this is a tongue plant. Give this thing some shading. So if you if you select something in Inkscape and then you hit Control L, it'll simplify and kind of cut down the number of nodes, which is also pretty nice. It takes away some rough edges and stuff. I'm gonna grab this. So one thing that I've learned from talking with Sam is that there's a tendency for when people are, are sort of first learning how to do art, there's a tendency to um, try to make shadows by simply using black. So you would like, maybe if you wanted to make this underside here, you would just go like black and then you'd kind of like reduce the alpha of it. What you notice is this is really muddy and, and in Photoshop, this is also people use the burn tool to make like a blurry, just blackness on top of stuff. Um, trouble is, is in the real world, uh, shadows are not just an absence of light. They're, they're oftentimes like other light sources get reflected into the shadow. So um, it's, it's rarely the case that it's just pure black shadow. And so you can actually add a lot of interesting atmosphere uh, by making shadows of different colors by just taking a full, full alpha thing and just putting some color into it. I'm gonna give this a little bit. All right, we'll just do this. Yeah, and if you're in space, uh, sh your, your shadow is just going to be totally black. So there's that. All right, so we're going to grab this weird tongue. And actually, so another thing you can do is you can use different. You want to kind of establish some rules for your line thicknesses. So, so I can say like this outer line here is going to be two pixels. That's 32 pixels. Two. There we go. Okay. Uh, and interior lines can be one pixel. So when we zoom out, um, then you'll you'll kind of see the the silhouette of things a little bit better. And I could probably even do. So with Inkscape, you can really just kind of play around with stuff and until you get it kind of 
kind of where you want it. And like I mentioned last time, you know, this is a good option for people who who can't draw very well. It's just uh, play around with nodes. Flip that. It's kind of like a weird tongue thing. <laughs> we'll put some kind of a some kind of a it's like a tongue flower. Okay. We can kind of go in and just tweak some stuff a little bit to update the perspective. Oops, oops, oops. We want to fill. So secretly, I'm just doing this stream because I want to practice my art. Throw some little extra colors in there, and then maybe, maybe we can um, add a little bit of sort of like ambient occlusion here, or at least pretend like we have ambient occlusion. A ambient occlusion is just the lighting effect that happens when uh, two objects are close together and they kind of put a shadow on each other. So you'll see this in a, like in a video game lighting where like if you turn on ambient occlusion then a shadow will kind of land in between like a, at a corner where two walls meet or something there'll be a like a, a little bit of a dark shadow in there okay so you notice what i do here is i'll, I'll create a shape for the shadow and then i'll just kind of like throw a weird shape out of there so then i can duplicate the Thing that I want to intersect with. Now I select both of them and I use the intersection tool. So now I have something that I can just overlay right on top and and it won't sort of spill out weirdly. Okay. What color should this be? We can do kind of like a little bit more of a reddish color. Duplicate this, cut out the middle so that we have an outline that covers the, the new shadow. Okay, so that's the top of our weird tongue flower. I'll just put one more uh, tongue thing back here. One day, you guys, I'm going to convince Sam to make art for this game. And then all bets are off. I'm going to steal that color. Just kind of tuck that back there. All right, now we need a stem for this thing. Stem. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna do this, boop. There we go. There's our stem. So if we wanted to, we could really animate this thing a lot where we could like uh, break apart the, um, the tongues and kind of animate them separately from one another, which would be kind of interesting. Rule stem. <laughs> uh, what color is this 
stem supposed to be? I feel like the stem should be kind of dark. One thing I learned from uh, some, some like character design docs and stuff from League of Legends is they tend to have lighter colors toward the top of the character and darker colors toward the bottom, especially since they're look, looked at from the top down because it kind of highlights um, you know, their head. All right, so we have this rectangle. Um, we can give it give it some like feet, I guess. Hope you guys are having a chill Sunday just listening to level head build mode music while I make a weird tongue flower. Can we join these nodes or can we not join these nodes? Ah, I see. I like barely hear the music. I'm gonna get that up a little bit. Granted, I don't want it to be too loud. All right, so I'm just kind of overlaying uh, this line here so that we've got like a contiguous stem coming down. Okay, that's decent. Maybe I'll look at putting a gradient on this thing to kind of give it a little bit more of a interesting feel. You gotta have a good mouth feel, you know, for your for your art assets. Okay. I'll take it. All right, so you can see how this will sort of sit uh, in the world. Kind of a weird, weird thing. Yeah, your game really needs to have a good mouthfeel. Otherwise, who's gonna want it? And not, yeah, not very many blogs review games by mouthfeel. Uh, is this going to be a fully-fledged game or a side project? So this is just for the purpose of this stream. And this is a totally freely available uh, game that I'm making on stream, giving away the source code. And I'm just taking requests from people who want to see how to do stuff. I think I messed up my... There we go. Yeah, so this is just for fun and, and just for for teaching anybody who wants to learn about game development, game programming, game maker, any of that stuff. All right, we're gonna put this into the game. So we don't need, we don't need the grid reference anymore. Now we're gonna create a bounding box for this thing. That seems about right. It doesn't particularly matter because we can move the origin pretty easily. We're gonna call this Tongue Flower.
Yeah, Inkscape is all about... I feel like vector art, you can really just sort of not care. It's like I started, I was like, I'm going to make a plant. And I was like, hey, my tongue or my leaf looks like a tongue. It is a tongue. There we go. Now we've got, <laughs> now we've got a tongue flower. All right, let's import our tongue flower. So the other thing you notice here is uh, I didn't have to worry about the size of the export. Because up here, you see it's 138 by 112. And then since I'm exporting at 90 DPI, then it's exporting at 139 by 112 pixels as well. So it all gets preserved. And when I open it up in game, then it's just inherently going to match the size of my tiles that I used for reference. Okay, so we got our tongue flower. I'm gonna, I'm gonna click down here and set the origin to the base of the tongue flower. Or actually, let's uh, now let's set up a, let's set up a little bit of a better system here. What do we want to do? This is kind of yeah. I guess in this case it's probably fine. We may have to refactor some things with with how objects land in the world a little bit later, but we'll take problems as they come. Okay, so we have that, and we need to name it. Now the question is, how do we get this tongue flower into the game, and where should it go? The tongue flower has some height to it, uh, which means we probably want to treat it like a solid object. So when I when I bump into it, actually, let's make a recolor of this as well, uh, so that we have just some kind of variety. Okay. So you notice that so I, I have these these tongues uh, sort of groups together, so they're like one complete object. But I can use the uh, the path node tool and see how when I highlight, it grabs it shows the red area around where that specific object is. So I can click on that, then I can shift click, and I believe I can just grab yeah just the tongues. So one thing you'll generally want to do in your games is try to find ways to break up um, what we would call the the soup of normalcy. So you'll have objects that are super common, like this tongue flower, and they just appear everywhere in the game. Um, but having sort of rare versions of common objects is uh, is a nice way to kind of break up the monotony of of having just too many of the same thing. And you want it to really stand out, so like purple to yellow is a nice shift. I'm not sure what happened with, with this one. Um, another tip when it comes to working with color is you, you rarely want to go with the maximum. So like if I did, you know, fully saturated, you know, maximum red. So anything that you have that's 255 red or 255 green or 255 blue and nothing else, uh, it becomes very blinding. So if I do this maximum blue, that's just way too much. If I do maximum green, that's also way too much. Maximum yellow is a little bit better because it's a mixture of red and green, um, but it's oftentimes good to kind of like tone it down a bit. Okay, so I'm gonna grab these undersides. Come on, gotta be a elite sniper to, okay, there we go. Grab these purple things, make those 
These are just there for texture so they can they don't need to stand out too much color wise. And the interior I think we got the wrong thing. Yeah. That's the stroke. Some kind of bright blue. Don't worry, it'll look better once I fix these other colors here. All right. And this under piece here. some kind of like a deep red or something. I probably want to flip that. All right. So now we've got our sort of rare that's a little too brown. I don't like that. I don't like that. Still pretty brown. Okay. Get this top fixed up. How am I doing the shadows on the stems at a gradient? Yeah, it's just a gradient. So you can see the gradient here from top to bottom. So I would probably normally also do maybe like chop it like that or even potentially add a shadow that kind of descends like this. Um, and then you could, you could clip that in and then put a gradient on there as well to kind of give it a little bit more depth even. But... I just want to get some assets in the game, so these can be replaced or, or touched up later as we need. All right, so I, I have the bounding box selected. I'm gonna set it to uh, no fill in the bounding box, and then I'm gonna export Tongue Flower Special, which sounds like something you could order at Denny's. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to import. I'm actually going to add a new sub image. Let's see. Ch -ch -ch image. Can't remember if this. Re okay, there we go. Yeah. So now we kind of have our special and non special version of the, of the tongue flower. So I'll, I'll push this out, actually, before we start spawning this thing. Tongue flowers. They exist. Okay. Why do they look so pixelated in Game Maker? Uh, that's just due to the size that they got exported at. So they're zoomed in a lot. So these are 139 by 112 pixels. If I hit this, then they zoom to their actual one-to-one -one scale. And then you can see that they are, in fact, not pixelated at that scale. Okay. Uh, so we need O underscore tongue flower sprite tongue flower. So uh, earlier on in the stream, we made this thing called O underscore world element, and what we said at the time was everything that spawns in the world should be one of these, and that's going to allow us to 
uh, pre-initialize a bunch of certain variables that we want on these. So the tongue flower is no exception. So this world element, okay, and that's going to give us a bunch of bunch of uh, variables. So so some of the things we have available is like blinking, squishing, uh, world depth, grid position, Z, all these things. Seamus asks, do you use objects for these kinds of things in crash lands or some kind of data structure? Um, a lot of times we'll have objects that share, or, or items in the world that share objects. Like we have a, a, an object that's just called O underscore pickupable. There's a lot of components that don't do anything other than you just pick them up. And so those all share an object in that case. And they just change their, their sprite. So it kind of depends on, on what your needs are. All right, so we have this tongue flower. Um, I don't think we have to worry about pretty much anything else at this point other than just having this object and then we can do some updates to it a little bit later. Uh, except for one thing, which is we need to update image speed. Image speed is a built-in variable in GameMaker that will cause uh, cause the object to cycle through its, its uh, frames. So if I didn't do that, then this thing would rapidly flash between the two frames. Okay, so something else we can do is we can say special equals uh, random one is less than or equal to point one. So this just means that. So in Game Maker, uh, Booleans are just numbers, so in a lot of languages, this would turn into like special equals false. In GameMaker, this is special equals zero, uh, or special equals one, and so I can set the image index as special. But there's another weird thing about Booleans in GameMaker, which is probably good to know, which is that something is true if it's greater than 0.5. Presumably it's because things get rounded uh, when evaluated, I would guess, or something. Jack Muskrat says, is it a bad idea to make sprites two times the size in Inkscape and then scale it down? Uh, does locking in an asset size cause problems? It kind of depends on what you're going for. So in this case, I might want to make like a, a large version oops, of the flower. So you'd have like a big one like that or something. Um, in that case, what we would probably do is actually export multiple sizes of the flower because we may also need to touch them up, add some detail. When you scale things down, they tend to get what I would call crunchy. Um, the anti-aliasing gets applied before they get scaled, oddly. So when they scale down, then you end up with with edges of things that you can clearly see the pixels and they kind of get a little bit weird. So you should you should kind of try to uh, keep things fairly close to the scale that you want. What we will tend to do in a game like this is uh, we would add some kind of a scale modifier, which I think we did with the berry. Okay, so the berry has this scale mod. Um, so we, we could probably actually just steal this code from the berry for now. So this would be, these tongue flowers would be anywhere from 60% up to full. Once you scale things below half, then you start to, I think, run into, into some, some bad visuals. And I'll just steal this code from the berry as well. We'll update these things later and, and probably turn them into a more coherent system. Oops. Draw event. And we want the image index. And for now, we'll just draw this at its normal Y position. Do, 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 all good. Okay, so we have our tongue flower objects. Now we just need to spawn them. And we have our script called generate stage which is where all this stuff happens. Um, so why don't we... All right, we're just gonna do this 
right next to where it happens, but later on we're going to want to go back and create some kind of like a, a like a database, I guess you would call it. It's not really a database, but a database of item information that we can then refer back to for spawn rates and stuff like that. Really, it's just going to be a giant 2D array that we store information in. All right, so we have our spawn order here. Um, and then last, we're going to spawn objects in the world. You guys see that text okay? All right, so we have our terrain locations and we have our terrain types. Okay. When scaling, will the center pixel change and make that wobble while spinning happen? Nope. It'll, the center pixel will be proportional. So as long as your center pixel is in fact in the center originally, in the normal version of your object, then you won't run into issues with that. All right, uh, so we're gonna say uh, edge spawn chance equals 0.5. Actually, we could even say spawn chances uh, interior, let's see, terrain type dot interior equals. We can give different spawn chances by the kind of terrain we're talking about. And we're going to run into some trouble here because we actually overwrote our bridge terrain with edges. So this is going to this is going to get a little bit tangled. And we're going to have to figure that out. Oh man, you guys, does Twitch does the Twitch website have a dark mode? Cuz I'm looking over here at chat and oh, it does. Oh, thank God. That's so much better. <laughs> Why is light mode the default for so many things? It's the worst. All right. So we're gonna iterate through our terrain locations. Uh, terrain. Holes. It'd be great to see an analog game interaction like aiming that isn't combat. You want to aim, but not use it for evil. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gathering. <laughs> you want to aim, you know, your watering can and grow some tongue flowers. All right, this train coordinates, uh, let's see, this type equals train types. And this spawn chance equals oops. This is the this is the uh, first game in a new franchise called Tongue Flower Moistener. And you just gotta really spritz those tongue flowers. Keep them keep them super damp. And there's going to be a lot of push notifications to make sure that you don't mess it up. We don't want these tongue flowers dying like your Tamagotchi did back in the 90s. Alright, this spawn chance, uh, random, random list of this spawn chance. And then we'll just make a tongue flower. Instance create. Tongue flower, and that's gonna be at this grid box equals. These are stored as coordinates. Yeah. Okay.
equals uh, coordinate to grid, and that is this world position. So you know, might notice here that we've done this conversion multiple times now where it's like coordinate to grid and then grid to world. Maybe we're missing something. Maybe we're missing a coord to world. Grid equals world. Grid x y zero. Grid x y one. Oops. You ever get your hands off of the home row and then you just just sling some gibberish? I love it. This is much better. We're gonna make a tongue flower. If the spawn chance is high enough, edges will give like a 30% chance. All right, so in theory, this will iterate over all of our terrain locations and put some tongue flowers in the world. My God. Okay, so what are we seeing here? For starters, it's a lot, it's a lot of tongue flowers. I think I can get rid of those berries, you know? Don't think we need that anymore. Okay, so, the shadows under these tongue flowers are not really visible. Also, they're just kind of sitting there, which is boring. I think we probably want to maybe add some squish, squishness. Yeah, our bridges are currently being considered as edges. So that's something we may want to resolve. Yeah, mine skills. I think Gandhi said that. Little known fact about Gandhi. That one. All right, so we're gonna give um, the tongue flower an animation timer, and we're also gonna beef up its width. Question is, how wide is this thing? So we'll go from sort of its Left to the right, which is 10, up to 129, so it looks like it's about 120 wide. And its height, gonna go 85 up to 11, so 70-ish. I'm also gonna make a debug object. Oh, we already have a debug folder. Whoops. I think a debug object that draws hitboxes. And what we can do in our gameplay controller is we're in debug mode. We'll just make that thing. This is a nice thing to do. Uh, so that you can make sure that if you have something like this, that you don't accidentally ship that with your game, because the game is not running in debug mode then. 
And you really only want to see that when you're debugging anyways. So all we're gonna do with our hitbox draw, we're gonna set the depth uh, pretty far back. Let's go really far back. Uh, then we are going to We're going to draw a rectangle. So the draw rectangle script or, or function, you give it the, the corners of the rectangle and then the colors you want to draw. I personally am not a big fan of that specific approach because typically I know where the middle of something is and the widths, which, uh, which means I have to now like do a bunch of math on that. So instead I'm going to make a new function um, under my drawing here, which is going to be draw rectangle centered. So I get two. I'm actually going to take half the width and height, which you'll see why in a sec. Center minus that. This is also going to cut down on the number of arguments that I need to give. And we can even do. optional alpha argument. Alpha equals argument six. Alpha. Okay. Now we can set up our arguments here. A little bit more human readable. Outline and alpha. Alpha is optional, so we'll put the little square brackets around it. So now we got a function to draw a rectangle from the center instead of having to do this subtraction, subtraction, addition, addition, color, 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 every time. All right, so my X center is just X. My Y center, we're actually gonna draw it from the Y minus height, five. Width is width, height is height, and color is, make it lime. Lime is a good color, that's just 255 green, nothing else. Outline, true. All right, so we have our hitbox draw. Let's run this in debug mode now, which will spawn our hitbox draw object. Bucks, hit box. Ooh, ooh, I don't see it. It's possible. That it was depth was too high. There is something about depth clipping. Yeah, there we go. Which those of you guys who played Fields of Goop will know that if you ran too far south, then you, everything disappeared. Okay, so this these little hitboxes will show sort of the, the width and height of things. Um, and these are not solid yet, so we'll need to we'll need to also take care of that. But I first want to make these squish. So let's do that. Tongue flower, and I want to move its origin down a bit. 
Okay, tongue flower, we've got our animation timer, and this is currently not taking into account its squish. And timer plus equals several seconds. Uh, squish set. We'll just say point. So we can do it really, we can squish it really hard at the beginning uh, so that we can just see what it's doing. And then we'll tone it down. Actually, I know about that. Okay. Squish set will uh, set our squish x scale and y scale variables. So we can take those into account. Starting to look like a game. Ooh, I hate this. <laughs> uh, look at that. Oh no, what have we done? They kind of have a jellyfish sort of a mouthfeel, don't they? Okay. Um, so we want to slow that down and really knock down the squish amount. Uh, I think we underdid it this time. Well, you want some maximum squish? <laughs> okay, so now they just have like a little bit a little bit of movement, which is, that's all you really need. You just need something, you know? Yeah, and also notice like they're not moving with the tiles. So that's another, another thing we'll have to deal with at some point. But nothing is respecting that tile bounce. So this is, I feel like probably this game is trending towards sort of like a extreme flower picking something. Some kind of a one of those sorts of games. It's sort of a distant relative to BMX biking. If anybody knows anybody at Red Bull, we should see if we can get a, a sponsorship. Now, just for safety, we need we do need to see maximum squish. So that one. So we've got our tongue flowers. That's good. I'm gonna push that out. Tongue flowers are now spawned in the world. All right. Next up, we're gonna need to do some solids. We're gonna need to do do these a solid. All right, so the first thing I want to do is hitbox draw. I don't want to just draw a, a rectangle because I'm actually going to set a circular hitbox around the base of these flowers. So uh, draw ellipse color. So ellipses actually have the same problem as rectangles, which is they're drawn from the corners. Odd. 
All right, Caliber, I'm happy to be background noise for your jam. Happy jamming. Color, color, outline. Okay, so we have the same arguments for our ellipse. So, oops, ellipse, centered. Exact same thing, except we are going to draw it. Um, so I'm actually gonna create like a fake 3D effect with this. I'm gonna stop drawing the rectangle, and we're not going to draw line, color, Y. You just have to trust me on this one. This is gonna, it's gonna be easier to show than to explain. Assuming I do it correctly. The ellipse. <laughs> Equals square root ratio. All right, so we're gonna draw, we're gonna create sort of an illusion of a hitbox here to show what is actually going to be happening behind the scenes, and then we'll make that happen. Unless I just totally, you know, ruined this. Debug mode. Okay, are you guys able to, s to see that? Okay, that's uh, it's one pixel, so it's a little bit maybe maybe hard to see. Yep. So now we've got cylindrical hitboxes, and that's what we're gonna want to use for our for our uh, actual collision masks. So I'll kind of show how to how to do that. Um. So this is basically what we're doing is we're, we have a, we know how wide the thing is. So we're gonna s squish that by the grid ratio that was calculated uh, last episode. And that gives us the shape of the ellipse. We know the height of the object. And then we just draw that same ellipse on top. So now you can see we've got these cylinders. I could potentially even draw the baseline cylinder with maybe a little bit darker or sort of filled in, sorry. Okay, so that should give a little bit better sense of when we bump into stuff, that's that's where the, the solid collision should happen. Just like that. So that's what we're gonna do next. Close everything down so we've got a fresh drawing space. Okay, I'm going to make a mask. This is gonna be a collision mask that we're gonna use for pretty much everything. Are we gonna start using this for all collision? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's just a visual representation of what's happening. And we'll, we will um, get the real thing set up here. Oops, resize, yeah, all right. 180 by 180, so that's our grid width is 180. So we're just gonna make a total circular collision mask like this. Ellipse, full image, okay. So we've got this. Do we work out of an office Monday through Friday? Yep, yep, we've got an office. 
We did work out of my basement for a year and a half, and before that we worked just out of our apartments. Yeah, the, uh... It's, it's nice to not have to stress about taking out the garbage and, and stuff like that for, uh, you know, six, five or six people. Okay, so now we're going to make a script called Set Mask. You know how wide this is. And mask index equals. Did I build the spa room? I started to, uh, but it turned out that having a spa room in a closet sucks because there's no air circulation in there. So you go in there, and then you just kind of boil, which is a less relaxing experience than I would have wanted. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm writing a script that I can use to set the, the collision mask of anything. And this is going to allow us to use that cylinder. So this means we're going to take that circular mask I just made, set it to the mask index of the object. So you can have a separate mask and a separate sprite. And the mask is just used for collisions and the sprite is used for visuals. Image X scale and Y scale will affect the size and shape of the collision mask. And so uh, so once we set the mask, then we can set the X scale based on the width that we want. And we can also uh, override, actually I can just do this. So we're, we're gonna override the objects, the setting objects width variable with the one given here so that we guarantee that it's consistent. Height, we don't really care about so much just yet. It's more used for drawing. Okay. Player. So we know the width of the player. Instead of that, we're gonna say set mask. Width is gonna be 70. And tongue flower. Um, here, so we know the width. It's gonna be that. Since we've already calculated that, we can just go ahead and, and overwrite that, that's fine. Okay, so we still aren't doing anything with this just yet. So I'm gonna set this tongue flower as solid, which means in game maker terms, it's just a checkbox that since we're doing our own movement code, we can now ask questions about whether we can go there. So the player's uh, world move. Do these masks use a lot more computer brain than rectangular masks? They sure do. Elliptical collisions are more expensive. So there may be an optimization challenge down the road, something like, you know, deactivating instances off screen. There's actually a big Yo-Yo Games tech blog about uh, the game Forager because they have thousands of instances that they have to manage and so they do a lot of really aggressive instance activation and deactivation. All right, so we have our script here, world pos open, which is our thing that we're using in our movement code to decide whether we can go somewhere. So all we have to do is update this world pos open. And for starters, there has to be a tile there. And then we can check for collisions. So uh, if we have a bunch of different functions available to us, I think we're gonna use place free, which checks for, let me just double check that. Yeah, so this this will just return if that position would would uh, have you bump into any kinds of solids in your game, and that I believe uses the mask. Let me check. Yeah, so this actually uses the mask of the calling instance, which means it would check if our two if our two ellipses would overlap, and so in this case, uh, I think this would 
do it. So let's let's run it in debug mode so we can see if those if those uh, ellipses work out. Okay, so now I can't I I can't go, I, can't, I can't do it. So now I can't pass through these. And because our movement code has that angle sweeping in there, then we have this nice sort of like slippery function where I can like I can just keep holding a direction and I'll just kind of kind of squeeze my way around these things if I if I can fit. So let's take a look at this in uh, normal gameplay without the masks being drawn. So it's also the case like this character feels Ooh, look at that. Got a nice wiggle. So the character feels kind of fast now. Just because we, our, our speed before was set so that we could look at the world more, and it seemed like we needed to move fast because there was nothing around. Now that we actually have objects, I feel like I'm going past these things at sort of a blistering speed. Um, so I'm going to turn my movement speed down. Six hundred, four hundred. All right, so that's just feels a lot more reasonable, I would say. Okay, so we're starting to get what looks game-like. We're gonna run into some issues with with our current setup, which is this, right? We can't, we're spawning these things on the bridges and we also, and we can't go through them. So one option is to update our spawning code so that these don't spawn on bridges. Another option is to give the player some means of destroying these, um, which is probably something we would just want to do anyways. Well, the question I have for you guys is, what even is our character what what is happening who am I in this world let me I'm gonna push this because this is good uh, objects in the world are now uh, solid and they have pollution masks Tongue machete. Look at our agenda here. So we've got you can put stuff in the world, some enemies. Uh, so we, we can put stuff in the world now, so that's good. Uh, it looks like we might want to add some kind of player ability, you know, to chop tongue flowers. We got a we gotta blast these tongue flowers out of existence. Um, so we could maybe do we could we could give the player uh, some kind of like a sweeping thing that you do. You could do like an area effect around the player. We could have the player sort of like charge, um, like kind of like charge through things and break them. Space explorer with a flamethrower and a <laughs> and a hose. For watering plants. Mm. <laughs> Why did there have to be tongue flowers? One out of five stars. Would not recommend. 1,000 hours on record. Kind of weirdly like the idea of like gardening, doing stuff with these plants. Let's try to figure out who the who the player is. Let's just get some shapes out there. Are you? 
Are you an alien? Are you fish? Are you a, a person? Do you have a head? Do you, are you just a head? Are you hunchbacked? Do you have arms? Do you have fins? What's the deal? Landscaper. Bravekeeper. where this is going. Kind of a... Kind of a green... Green character. Let's get a... Let's get a head put together here. We'll get the pen tool. A little bit of a... Get some, just get some shapes going. Center those. Some kind of cat person. Cats are, I've heard that, uh, Cats are pretty big on the internet these days. That's like a new thing that's going on. People on the internet talking about cats. I'm gonna kind of cash in on that, I think. <laughs> the Cats movie. <laughs> That was, let's not, let's not go there. Do a little bit of this, a little bit of this. Don't worry you guys, I know I'm getting a feel for this, for where I'm going. That was close. We almost made a game about cats. Now it's got horns. They're good at gardening. They're good at keeping things alive. They don't kill things for fun or anything like that. Kind of, it's kind of... Get a, little, get a little curve on these horns. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, it's Gerblin. So now I gotta like get these horns detached from this head somehow. My Inkscape skills are not to par for that. Or maybe they are. Intersection. 
Yes. Duplicate that. All right, so maybe this is the story of a demon who is given up demon life and just wants to grow some flowers. legit. Alright, we got these horns. Are demons green? I'm not up on the I'm not up on the lore. Yeah, what's the scientific consensus on this? And this one I am going to just knock the alpha down. I just want to give feeling of, you know, horn wrinkles. All right, we need some eyeballs on this thing. Alright, Ziok, once you uh once you get done with the tongue flower stuff, just uh if you could take a look at what's been going on with demons lately. That would be helpful. Gonna need some it's a tired demon. Is it a demon or a devil? I think it's just a... Just a low-class demon. You know, just... Like, an, I think they're... Aren't they like the interns? of the underworld or something. I don't know. It's just a green thing. I'm going to turn these down just a bit more. I think we got, I think we got it. Shadow under that lip, you know? Eh, hey, yeah, green thumb. Uh huh. Green thumb. We got our game. Some kind of a monster. Just really wants to get into gardening. That, smooth that out. 
just a little bit, nothing too extreme. Yeah, I think we got it. Horns could do some work. I could probably do a gradient on his head, just to kind of give him a little bit more of a... It's all about that mouthfeel. Yeah, that's that's better. How would we describe the mouthfeel of this demon? Probably pretty crunchy. Got a good tang. What color are demon horns? Are they grayish blue? It seems right. Can I just steal this gradient? I think I can. Boom! All right, if we zoom out, does this demon give us good vibes? All right. And I'm probably gonna animate animate his head separately. So his head is going to be drawn off of his body. And that way when he runs around, then his head will kind of lag, lag behind. Oh yeah, he's got a good forehead going on. And by looking in two directions at once, this is a good strategy for finding the, the best plants, you know. Okay, on to the body. Let's get his hand first, actually. I want to get some extra bits in there. Merge those. Get that. Delete that node. Delete those. Sam decided not to draw for the stream. At the moment, one day, gonna just come busting in here. You'll see. No, that's probably not true. He's a very private worker. When he's working on stuff, he cannot be disturbed. I just want to get a good, good hand going here, or something hand-like. Boom. 
But you know what they say about hands. They're hard to draw. I don't know if you guys have heard that. Do we have any hand artists on the stream? Anybody? Starting to get there. We'll just, uh, we'll just leave it there. It's going to be a good enough moment. Make sure we get those rounded. I don't know why this thing doesn't want to turn into... Ah, there we go. Good knuckles. Okay, we'll put some shading on there. This area. I think the one issue we're going to have with, uh, selling this game, you guys, is that the dog hair physics aren't going to be quite as realistic as people are now accustomed to, you know, in, in modern, modern graphics cards. So I think we're, we're probably going to have to just avoid putting dogs in the game. Okay, we got our weird sort of claw hand thing going on. He's ready. Looks like he's about to take off on a motorcycle journey. That's a strong hand. <laughs> All right. What is going on with his body? I think you can use the Align tool for individual nodes. Let's do it. Boom. Flattened his feet. Overalls with pockets, I am on board. Overalls kind of have, it's going to have this kind of a vibe, right? So we're going to 
take this shape, grab that, give him some. Do monsters have s standard denim, or what's the fashion? Maybe they have some other kind of fabric that's better than denim? I would assume so. Let's kind of get that down. Let's get his head out of the way so we can really... It gives him a really different vibe, you know? Different head positions. <laughs> so proud. Okay, so we got that, and then these need to be kind of held up by buttony strap kind of things, right? Haven't worn uh, coveralls in many moons. Barefoot, so he can feel the tongue flowers squish between his toes. <laughs> I think we want to we want to in widen his front foot a little bit. Yeah, in widen. What color is his shirt? He's got to have some kind of a... I want to do plaid, but that's a lot of shapes and stuff. So I'm not really down for that. Maybe kind of a... Yeah, kind of a desaturated red thing he's got going on. Okay, so we're gonna need some some pockets here. Object path, object to path. So I'm gonna wanna get this character in and animated the stream is over. So that's my... I got 20 minutes. Actually, I kind of wonder if I delete that. Maybe what we need is like a pocket sort of uh, shadow, you know. Let's use our lighting skills.
Oh yeah, we can't do red. We can't do red shirt. That now this is Mario. Look, it looks just looks exactly like Mario. Nintendo's very litigious about these kinds of things, so we gotta. Tone it down. <laughs> we need some kind of a buckle here, but I'm not going to go too intense on it. Like normally, there's like a, a button thing, and then you kind of hook it hook it in there. Do we have any coveralls sort of professionals in here? Hey, that'll, that'll work. I think I actually want to I don't want to kind of like slice that out and then do something like that. Something. Let's use the mouse to do horizontal flip. Oh yeah, what's the Oh, there's just there's just an H key. Thanks. Thanks for that. You may notice that I only use Inkscape once a year. Delete. Yeah, guys, if you see me doing something dumb, call me out on that because it's helpful for me. those coveralls, cut off that excess, messed up his feet, and his crotch area, just do this, fix it up once again. Thumbs in his coverall straps, like a pro. Okay, so we've got something character-like. Last we'll give it a little bit of depth with the power of gradients. Don't worry about that. Is this the main character or an enemy? I don't know. This might be one of those games where, you know, you are your own nemesis. You know what I mean? Alright. I want to... animate this character in parts. So the body, we want to give a little bit more space because uh, we're going to have probably extra frames with wildly flailing limbs, which is important.
I'm going to point the hand to the right so that when we set our angles and stuff, then we know the actual angle the hand should be going. I'll break this character apart and give it multiple pieces, and then we reconstruct the pieces using code. Export time. Main char body. Let's be main char hand. Let's bring it in. Oh, yeah, blinking. There's literally no point in having this character if it's not blinking. So we have a couple options for blinking, actually. One really easy one, which I would recommend, is this. Now we just have, whoops, now we just have an overlay, and when he blinks, we'll just draw those. Curve them. make him a little bit darker. So we could have put some eyeshadow or something on there. This monster doesn't want to just go out gardening without some prep, you know. someone to add smear frames so we're not even gonna have frames at the moment of any kind all right so technically we've only got 10 minutes this might go over a little bit getting this character animated okay so what we have to do to animate a character in code is essentially establish directional relationships and distance relationships between the different parts of the body. So we might say, oh, the hand is going to be this far away from the body at, you know, negative 10 degrees, and the head is going to be 90 degrees up, and it's going to be blah, blah, blah. So, so let's take a look. at our baseline. Let's go ahead and get X offset. Okay. So 
I've actually developed a suite of scripts that take care of all this stuff uh, sort of on its own, but it wouldn't really be helpful for anybody. If I just drop those in, I think it's better to kind of talk through the process and see how it works. Um, okay, so we have our body x offset and our body y offset. And what we want to know is where is the head going to be drawn? So we'll draw it like there. 85, 46. Uh, so we'll call it limbs. We'll say body part. Uh, head. The head is a limb, right? So first we're going to just grab where it is drawn on the sprite, which is 8546. And left is going to be 1. That's going to be the character's left hand, not our left. It just wants to tend to the tongue flowers. Is that so much to ask? All right, so we'll draw the left hand maybe like here, 17, 79. right hand will draw over here 3179 okay and then we can just put our origin right back in the middle is there a reason you do it based on the character left right versus our left right it doesn't really matter we shouldn't really have to remember it that often um, in crash we actually used front arm and back arm, meaning the the arm that was closest to the camera and the arm that was on the back side of the body. Um, yeah, it's... My stance on it is just pick something, and then if it does turn out to be confusing as you're working with it, then switch it. Okay, uh, so we've got these positions, and now we can go back through and establish the directional relationships between these things. I equals zero, I less than. All right, so now we'll say limb distance is going to be point distance. So we're going to grab the origin point that we currently set and then the point that we chose and see how far away they are and what direction they are from each other. Body Y offset and that's going to be the current X and Y of the limb that we are talking about. And then we'll do the same. Thing, but get limb direction. Okay, and we could even just go ahead and just include the body in here. It's not really going to hurt anything. body location is just going to be its normal offset. Okay, so we have our distance and our direction. And we also want to think about the ordering here, the depth sorting. So we want the body to be drawn first. Then we will draw uh, the 
right. Now we'll draw the head, and then, then the hands. I think that's fine. The hands will be in front of the head. So, that, so as his hands move, they won't go like under his <laughs> neck or something. Okay, so we have our distance and direction. Um, now we should be able to just iterate over our current setup here. And then later we can add some modifiers to this stuff. So, length 1D, limb direction. So we'll figure out where we're going to actually draw the the whole collection of assets from. And we'll say, wait, we need to set what the sprites are. Body part, body. If we want to animate other things in the game using this, then we can we can go ahead and turn this into a collection of scripts to standardize this function. Because you notice how I'm repeating this stuff, right? I'm copy paste, copy paste all these different things that I'm doing. Which is as soon as you find yourself copy pasting a bunch, then you know it's an opportunity. Okay, got my sprites, body part, head, head. Okay, so this isn't gonna look right at first and we'll have to adjust it because there's gonna be scaling issues, rotation issues, stuff like that. So draw the limb sprite. For now, we'll just draw a sub image zero. Draw base. It's gonna be y minus 0.5 z. X draw base. Uh, we will draw it at y draw base plus. So this is where we get into our distance and direction. We're now going to add the distance and direction from the base, and that's going to now draw the limbs at the different positions that we originally established. And for now, we'll just do scale of 1 for everything, rotation of 0, all that. Okay, so this is going to be a bit strange for now, and then we'll stitch the rest back together. Ew. Okay, so, so positionally, we are generally in the right place. Uh, we have problems with is rotation of hands, uh, scaling of hands, and also just like what what would be the point of doing it like this if it just turns into just a completely static image, right? That's no good. So, um, so let's kind of go through and figure that stuff out. But for starters, once again, actually, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a script animation and set up limb. Okay, and then this is going to our x origin. We'll say x offset. We'll say rotation base. got the 
the then my D, we've got the X offset, we've got the Y offset. Uh, need the sprite. So I'm just taking what I was just doing and turning it into a convenience function so we don't have to keep pasting stuff over and over again. Limb sprite, uh, limb rotation base, limb x scale. That's gonna be sprite rotation like that. The nice thing about doing all this in a script is we can easily add functions to this over time. And we can also use this in other, to animate other things. Set up limb. Body part, body. Uh, body X offset, body Y offset. Sprite is... Body, rotation base is zero, X scale is one. Let's all right. So get rid of that. Then we'll just steal this. The head is now 85, 46, head. And hand, 117, 79, hand. I'm just stealing all the info here. I'm doing it quickly so that I make plenty of mistakes. All right, so the hands, we want a base rotation of, I don't know, like negative 45 or something like that. X scale of left hand is gonna be negative one. Ooh, actually, it's the Y scale that we want. So we want Y scale because if we look at the hand, it's oriented to the right, which means if we flip the Y scale, then now it becomes a, a left hand. So setting up a, a bunch of scripts to handle this for you is super nice because of the fact that this stuff gets pretty weird to think of, to, to think through, and if you've got a set of functions that just take care of stuff for you, then you don't have to think about it. Okay, Y scale, Y scale, all good. All right, so we have our limbs. draw the limbs. So now we want limb x scale, limb y scale, and the reason we're doing this rotation base is so that we can change the rotations later. Okay, I think that might do it. Okay, so it's got his left hand, but it's rotated in the wrong direction. <laughs> so, we're getting there though. So left hand is currently negative 45. We'll go positive 45. And that is also wrong. So we want to go negative 135. I think we just undershot. So some of these, like once you're dealing with, with lots of scaling and rotation stuff, I think it's easy to uh, kind of get into a position where you're trying to do a lot of math to figure out the perfect way to do it. Sometimes it's fine to just plug in a number and if it doesn't work, just try the other number, you know? 
Alright, so his hand being in front of his head is actually a little bit weird. I think his hands are a little bit too high. So I'm going to take his left hand, put it behind his head, like this. And both of his hands are at 79. I'm going to just bump them down a little bit. Six pixels. Okay, so it's a little bit better. I think we could probably move his head to the left a little bit and up a little bit. It's made a little too hunchbacked. Okay, so we have we have our character. Um, I'm going to open it up in debug mode so you can see what else is going on here with the hitbox. So the the height of the character is just wrong, and so is the width. Um, and that's why you can see how I'm kind of going down through my own shadow, like my feet aren't touching the ground. Uh, we're also missing our blinks. So when we set up our limbs, we want to... Set out the image index. So all we gotta do is just keep working on this array. Uh, and we can then easily just do pretty much anything we want. So now we could say like limb image uh, index of limb head or, or body part head. Is blinking? Yeah. I think we just said is blinking, yeah. So I swapped out what image we're drawing there, and presumably that'll do it. Oh, right, we need to do an overlay because we actually replaced the whole thing. So now, what do we want to do? And blink. So we're just going to draw the, the head and the blink in the same location. And the head blink is sub image of one. And then we can once again update our system here to handle alpha. So we can just hide that. So this is all just setup stuff so that we can more easily manipulate this stuff later. The last thing we're missing is color, which I'm sure will come up. Limb alpha. Body part head blink equals is blinking. Okay, blinking, that's all good. I'm gonna get the height moved so that the character's height is more accurate. Take a look at this body. So I could just guess, or I could actually you know, try to do it correctly. So we have, we're at 80 right now. The bottom of the character's feet is 137. So that means we are 57 away from the bottom. Means it's a 114. So it's a little bit off. And let's see. Let's see if that works.
Okay, so now I'm standing in the right spot. My width is, is wrong, which you can tell by my shadow. So let's also update that. My, my body width is probably the thing to use. So, so it goes from 21 to 19, so it's like about 100. Set mask, 100. So we're just kind of reconciling all of our previous systems with this new piecemeal animation thing. Alright, so we have that. It's good. Now let's take a look at rotation, because we are rotating the character. So the next thing we want to do is uh, update direction. Equals. So we have the limbs uh, direction plus the rotation of the character. Take that into account. Actually, I'm not going to update the limbs rotation just so you can see what's happening here. So, so we are now <laughs> doing kind of, a, kind of a jiggly dance move. And what was happening previously um, was we were rotating the spread. So this character is rotating the draw direction from center of all the different objects or all the different limbs that we're drawing. But we are drawing the limbs, them, we are changing the rotation of the limbs themselves. Which is kind of awesome, I have to. <laughs> Keep that in mind. We'll go back and recreate that if we need to. Uh, what I want to do first is make a standard way to draw these things, and then we can go back and update the direction of limbs and stuff. Limb rotation base. That's that. Now we've got sort of a South Park style animation going on here. And the reason is our rotation is being immediately set. Okay, so whenever we jump, we're just like snapping the rotation. Uh, we don't have to do that. Instead, we can remove this from the step event when we bounce, and instead we'll say um, if z is less than zero, say if z speed is less than zero, which means we're moving upward, then just a little bit. So this is much smoother. And once we actually get some animation frames where his legs are where his legs are uh, kicking around, then this will feel a lot better. It's also the case that the original rotation amounts were set based on um, based on the fact that the character was a little square, and this much taller character now just doesn't need as much rotation to make that work. Hold on, what's that? Got a lonely dog. 
She just needed to be in the room. Okay, so if our Z speed... We could probably speed up this rotation, actually. And let's knock down the amount of rotation we have. Okay, so the last thing I want to do here is have his hands and head slightly trail behind the body. So we're going to... Yeah, that's right. We haven't done anything useful with this system yet. We're just kind of like getting the baseline stuff established. All right, so we have X offset and Y offset. Oh, and actually we need, we need to establish distance and direction in here just so that we have them for use later. And one thing we could do later on as well is update this system to allow for parent limbs. So you can say, I am, you know, attached, I'm a hand, I'm attached to an arm, or whatever. So then you, then you need to kind of pre-calculate the limbs in a hierarchical order, which is kind of interesting. So if limb distance, limb direction. Um, so limb X, X offset and Y offset is only used to calculate distance and direction. Um, so... Once we do that, then we can reuse those, those slots in the array uh, to assist with drawing. Because now, now we know how far away they are from stuff. So we could, for example, um, add X, the location we're drawing a limb, and we say plus x offset. Okay, so now we are t we are adding some extra offset values that we can use. So if we wanted to, for example, we can now make him do kind of a like a weird sine wave with hands and head. We could say. Do we have an animation timer? Don't think we do. And a timer, zero. So the sine waves are gonna be your best friend when it comes to a lot of these animation techniques. So we got uh, limb Y offset. We're just gonna do like three, the right hand and do the opposite and then we can do some goofy crap with the head Exactly what the head is doing. So I want a little bit more of that. And I want to speed it up as well. Okay, so now we've got. I, I still think it's too slow.
this is someone who is very jazzed about picking tongue flowers. Yes. Gotta get that sideways head bob. And we could even add, you know. So right now we have this head X offset. If we wanted to, we could say, give the head a direction. And we could say, head direction is uh, 360 times amp timer. So then the head X offset becomes length dir X, head dist, head dir. And then the head Y offset. We can maybe cut that down. Oops, that's wrong. So what we're doing here is we are we're picking uh, some degrees, and then we are uh, using length dir functions to make the head kind of go around in a, in a circle. So what we can end up doing with these things is we could now, depending on what the player is doing, we can manipulate the positions and orientations of the limbs and, and what the limb is that they're doing. So essentially this is, this is how Flux is created in Crashlands. The one difference being Flux also has legs, whereas this character has the legs built in. And then I want to last try to get, um, let's see, let's do this, uh, limb z lag, or I'll just say limb z. All I'm going to do is, as the player's z changes, I'm going to have the limbs linear, do linear interpolation toward the Z of the player, but with a very small amount of lag behind it. Or actually a pretty decent amount. Um, so then, I can just say... plus equals that. So we'll get the hands... So as long as we are setting the Y offset of these body parts, then afterwards we can add the limb Z to them. And that's going to... Any reason I didn't use a loop? Hey, this is backwards, but it's kind of awesome. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Let's go pick some flowers. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I didn't use a loop there primarily because I'm excluding the body. And I don't know if I'm going to be inserting things in between the body parts at that point. So... Obviously, we want to subtract that, or do we? This is one of the fun parts about animating with code, is you get some very bizarre results. <laughs> so now we are... Let me think. Oh, I know. I know. The issue is the body is already being moved by the Z amount, and then the limbs are being drawn relative to that. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated than what I had originally planned. 
So I'm gonna not worry about the limb Z for now, and that's something that we can fix up next time. Limb Z. Not a problem. So we we still need to X flip the character and uh and take into account that sort of lag with the head and the hands, so that's something we'll have to take care of next time. So, all right. I think that's all the time we have. I'm gonna have this video up available on YouTube. Push this out as well. Main character's animated. So source code's available on GitHub for anybody who wants to pull it down. You can just pull it down as a zip file. So even if you don't have Git or you don't know how to use Git, you should be able to just get a zip and uh, you have all this stuff. Um, if you follow the stream, I also will be creating uh, an event for the next time the stream is coming up. I believe it's gonna be this upcoming Saturday, but just keep an eye on that. Um, and otherwise, if you hop into the uh, B Scotch Discord, you'll get notifications about that stuff as well. So, thank you all for hanging out with me today, and I will see you next time.